now we have the pleasure of having Karina Fitzner join us from School District 79, which is Cowichan. And she will be discussing uh, comprehension and vocabulary building strategies. So let me just uh, see, Karina, are you with us? I am. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I will do my very best to contain my COVID coughing. I'm one of the, I'm part of the COVID summer team. Seems there's a few of us out there. Yeah, I think, I think there's four of us that are dealing with that right now. It's ridiculous. So my name is Karina Fitznar, and as mentioned, I'm coming from Couch in School District number 79. Um, I am actually currently on the uh, traditional and unceded territories of the Cowitz and Mistima or Cowitz and people. Um, and I'm actually really grateful that so many people, I can't believe, taking time out of um, beautiful summer to <clears throat> and free time okay. to do this work because it really is work of equity. And I do really feel this is allyship in action. So I just, I raise my hands to everyone who's come together and it, it's pretty cool. Um, so I have taught for 24 years, taught K to 12. Um, my master's in curriculum and instruction from UVic is actually as an uh, ECE slant. And I did ECE because early childhood education, because I wanted to learn um, about literacy and I wanted to learn um, about learning. So I found that even in teaching senior grades, uh, really what made me effective with the older students was things that I learned in primary. So I wanted more of that. Um, sorry, I'm just switching my view here. And da -da -da -da, I've taught uh, in Mexico, Belize, and I mean, largely in Cowichan, but also in Mexico, Belize, and North Carolina, which has been great having those different perspectives. And I think one of the most powerful experiences I had that's I find really relevant right now uh, was teaching in a socio-constructivist school um, for a few years in Mexico um, and they were inspired by Reggio Emilia approach and that was where I really learned probably not a, a typical association but that's where I really first learned about systematic explicit instruction within a constructivist environment. Like it was just really powerful. So those two things are not as at odds and people I find these days are grappling with the research between the two, that there is no between. Um, it, we can empower those really concrete, explicit systematic pieces and empower students with literacy and foundational pieces with empowering their voice and agency and personal empowerment. It all comes together beautifully. So I've seen it, I believe in it. And um, that's probably one of my experiences that I value the most. Um, so today um, we're familiar with five critical components and I don't wanna be repetitive. I'll do my very best to not be repetitive within this. Um, but because uh, the focus today is in tier one instruction, and really with a secondary lens, but it's very applicable uh, grade four to 12 easily. Um, but I use a lot of the same things in grade one, two, as I do with my grade 12s. So while there are students in upper level uh, classes that do require explicit one-on-one -on -one, uh, interventions with phonemic awareness and phonics, I'm not going to be focused on that today. Just talking about a, a cross-curricular, big, big bang for the buck strategies that can work in pretty much any setting. Um, and where this information has come from, aside from just what I feel works, <laughs> is that National Reading Panel uh, would be one of the biggest uh, pieces of research. I mean, the large, the whole science of reading, of course, but it's all coming from those anchor places, um, Consortium for Reading Excellence, um, definitely National Reading Panel and the Foundations for Literacy cool Toolkit, the Canadian version. So that's where um, that's coming from. I was not going to address fluency. However, I just came back from Ireland. I was presenting there and spent some time with Dr. Um, Young, who works a lot with uh, Timothy Rosinski, and his focus was on fluency. So I felt I would be um, really negligent and not sharing a little bit what I got out of that. 
So start off with fluency, go through the others and sort of a quick survey. I'm not getting too deep with anything, but I will connect with different pieces of research and resources. So as we just uh, were beautifully um, listening to Catherine there about fluency, speed, accuracy, and, and uh, proper expression prosody. So, but Dr. Chase Young, um, this quote here is really focused on after we have that automaticity, we've got that accuracy. We don't want to focus on the rate. I don't like the word speed, actually, rate, then appropriate rate. It's the focus should be on the expression. So once a student's achieved a certain level, level of automaticity, further increases of automaticity as measured by oral reading rate should not be a priority. The point of this is fluency is still incredibly important but just not in that way that we do in the younger grades. So um, this is one thing that's actually in our curriculum, but in BC, but also um, a lot of his research was done with um, university students and in particular drama majors who, uh, and drama majors who had struggled with reading. And they were saying that it wasn't until they got into the older grades, they were doing certain activities where they were being exposed to pre-teaching of vocabulary, repeated readings, and um, analyzing the use of punctuation and structure to derive meaning. So those pieces, that fluency, um, it's, well, what is the strategy that works? And his research um, is, he shares openly on his website. And the website, I, I do have a collection of all these um, links and resources for you, um, is, thebestclass.org. It's just gold. So what come, what uh, does his research show? He focuses on reader theater. We just heard a little bit about um, reader theater and poetry. Um, he does all, he's published extensively with Rasinski and other um, fluency and, and vocab leaders. Um, and so his reading readers theater resource and there's a little screenshot of his website, has uh, scripts and approaches and everything one could, could need to get going. It's fantastic. He's very accessible. Um, he welcomes opportunities to share and, and creates opportunities for, for colleagues to share. Um, he also <laughs> gets into some, oops, poetry pieces and slam poetry as, as a framework. So by um, engaging in the readers, readers theater and the poetry, um, you are, it's a very authentic task and that purpose of, of the repeated readings and whatnot. One thing to really keep in mind though, if the focus is about the reading and the fluency and that experience and, and understanding the nuance of text and interpreting it, we need to ask ourselves, do the students actually really need to perform it in front of the class? Because people say, well, the engagement, some kids don't want to. Do they have to? So it depends on what you're assessing and what you're going for, because that experience is so rich that often um, students could have the opportunity of maybe choosing their audience, choose three to five people who you're comfortable with performing in front of, or a private viewing, or it's pre-recorded. So we just got to watch, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater with some of these more active and expressive pieces because they're very powerful, but sometimes they get lost in not knowing how to navigate um, uh, reluctant students. Poetry and Voice is a federally uh, supported initiative, extensive library, and invitations to participate in competitions. Um, again, I always have competitions as a choice because otherwise it shuts down engagement, especially for struggling uh, readers. Poetry Slam is a framework and we already heard about Fluency Fridays um, where the students uh, choose a piece that they would like to practice and, and perform or share with the crew. So one thing that Dr. Uh, Young shares that is available on his website are some sort of weekly approaches that he has. So this is where, you know, in secondary, it's a bit of a thing, depends on how you're, how you're blocked. Is it a year long course? There's so many different scheduling um, issues that sometimes one context in one school won't work in another, but he does have examples of how um, this could be approached over a week or stretches over two, however it works. 
Um, just wanted to highlight that. A little word on his website. He does have a little section. He talks about balanced literacy. It's a funny thing in that he is very involved in science of reading. Again, who he's working with and, and all that. Everything is heavily research-based. Um, but I think he interprets that in a slightly different way different way. So just go in with an open mind there. So that leads us into um, comprehension through the background knowledge and vocabulary. So I just want to touch into background knowledge and vocabulary and hit a couple of big bang for your buck approaches there. So once a foundational level of literacy has been achieved, the greatest indicators of student student comprehension and problem solving is background knowledge and vocabulary. And we really see that after, and some people ask, well, why do these assessments only go up to grade eight or grade nine? Well, beyond that, access to the text, the language becomes more discipline specific or context specific. So whether or not a student has been exposed to that vocabulary, to that content, again, vocabulary and background knowledge holding meaning, if a student has access to that, then they will be have access to those texts. So it gets harder to sort of standardize an assessment beyond that grade. So, or beyond sort of a grade nine, and, and often people would argue grade seven. So that's why sometimes charts stop at that time or at that level. Um, background knowledge being two things. So it's engaging prior knowledge, but building new knowledge. And we've already heard about the knowledge gap um, and talking about knowledge like Velcro sticks best uh, to other related knowledge. This crosses over into vocab directly. So we'll see a little bit of uh, not repetition, but recursiveness within this. So that building the new knowledge, there's real intersection these days where students have very limited vocabularies and background knowledge. Um, part of that has been allowing students to specialize where yes, follow your, in, follow your interests, but not in a way that limits your exposure to the world, right? Also content knowledge is background knowledge. So all of that that we've already heard on a little bit. Um, valid foundation. So background knowledge is content knowledge and this will all be uh, available to you. This does cross over into that constructivism piece though. So allowing students to come up with their own understandings first is really important. So I, this painting, I'm just gonna do a jump forward and jump back. This painting, for example, a really great strategy is notice and wonder. What do you notice, what do you wonder? We see this, we go, yeah, 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 we notice and we wonder, but we jump to the wonder, we jump to the interpretation. This, using visual cues to build background knowledge and engage all learners in critical thinking, um, in activating vocabulary, in building understandings is so powerful and it is so inclusive. Every student can notice something in here. So if you just look at this image, some of you may have noticed right away the forked tongues and the pointed teeth. Forget what it means. Having students really sit in observation, that is scientific process, right? This is so in, uh, relevant in approaches to studying of social studies and science, that noticing, noticing, and sitting with that noticing and wondering. So the noticing, students can notice the green clouds, the, the duck down on the bottom there, the pipe head, and and spending more time on that than you think, and by warding off, sort of halting that, going to the interpretation, you're allowing all students to engage in something they can. Anyone can notice the clouds are green. The moment a student starts speaks, uh, speaking into a solution, like, oh, this must mean, you know, the teeth are a symbol of evil. As soon as you get into the symbols and the metaphors and the interpretation, the wonder gets shut down. So it's so important to sit with that, allow all voices to engage and kids will start noticing. They'll start really listening. Even those ones that are reluctant because it's like they too noticed the green clouds. They didn't know what those, those symbols were on the ties but they could connect with this in some way. So it is very inclusive. And then when you've sort of stalemated you've really covered all things and you've validated all of those rich ideas. Like, okay, so now let's look at some of those pieces how could you interpret them? What could they mean? What could they be symbols of? And let's try to gain 
as wide of his understanding. So if you have an, an interpretation different to someone else's, that's what we want to hear. And it's engaging with text. You can see how this would be leading to um, text analysis and interpreting text and using examples from a text to support your ideas. But doing it this way, visually and orally, supports all of that work that students will be doing independently inside their heads, right? So really unpacking it. It's way more powerful than, um, than I think we give credit. So that's the same with um, oral discussions and starting off the day with current events or short videos, or, I mean, I love art because it can be very, provocative and totally accessible. But if you think of that teacher that you had that did banter, right? You came in and there was a, some something out of the news the teacher would talk about and you'd have all these rich discussions. If you were someone who was more confident in school, you probably can think of somebody um, or maybe just anybody could. But what ends up happening often is about 80% of the students so we just did a little casual inventory. We're playing with this idea. Often there's a bulk of the students who do feel excluded because they don't have those sorts of conversations at home. So they don't have the background knowledge to access this conversation. But that means they need it more than anyone else. So that banter, that talking about the current events is so incredibly important because you're bringing the world to these students at that time. So just pausing and being more intentional with it. So create it, bring in the visual, bring in the, the article, define the words you're using, um, do a check-in for understanding so it's more inclusive. Imagine that those couple of kids out in the periphery who don't get exposed to these conversations, how valuable this is for them, and think about what did they need to access this conversation by building it within the group, which takes a couple minutes longer. You've then included them as well. And it's right there, you're building um, lived knowledge. So the, and it's also thinking about background knowledge to access the learning of the text, right? So this painting could be kicking off some discussion about the oil industries and different perspectives. And then maybe we're going to move to reading a, a challenging grade level text, but we're going to open up with, with bringing the ideas to life bringing perspectives to life, bringing the vocabulary to life, building all that background knowledge. So visual, layered, and giving more time to noticing and observing than, than you might think. It might feel really awkward at first, but it, it's beautiful. So another strategy, aside from notice and wondering and, and really banter, play, that connection, learning is fun, is something called the quad text set. So I love quad text set for building background knowledge and, and that vocabulary as well. <coughs> and it creates multiple entry points to scaffold comprehension of a challenging target text. Students, even those, especially those who struggle, need to be exposed to grade level texts, but they need strategies to engage with that, strat that text and the background knowledge and vocabulary in order to access that text. So sometimes we sacrifice, um, especially in, in discipline areas, so with social studies, well, we could just assess that knowledge, the content knowledge orally. Sure you could, absolutely. That, that, and that sometimes that's a fit. But other times we also want to, a learning standard is not just the content, it's the competency. So it's all that thinking. Can they apply the knowledge? Can they engage with that knowledge? Can they engage with those ideas? <clears throat> to build that, this is a great strategy. So not in any particular order, you will have your target text. I mean, well, okay, maybe that comes first because you want to know what your target is. So your target text will be the goal. So it's either at or above grade level. Exposing students to academic work and showing them how to chunk that down is a fantastic activity. Um, my students, my grade 12, a couple of years ago when we were doing that, my 11s and 12s, they actually, I got feedback afterwards when they were in college thanking me for that experience. Um, we looked at how would you chunk out an academic text. Now, I'm not just thinking about the academically minded students. Um, students going into trades, have you looked at those trades manuals? They are enormous, right? So that could be a target text as well. We need strategies to deal with these larger challenging texts. So target text, 
at or above grade level. Then three other texts to support that, probably starting off with the visual. So something like what we just spoke about, um, simple and engaging. Everybody can access this building background knowledge visually and orally. Then two other texts, um, a brief complementary text. So something that's not really strenuous, something shorter, but complementary. So if your target text is something heavy and academic, perhaps a related poetry piece or something more creative, or a completely different genre of writing. Maybe it's some propaganda written by uh, a corporation. It could be, yeah, piece of advertising, a poem, anything. Song, right? Song, very political, really exciting. And an accessible text. So something that everybody, ideally everybody, there's always an exception, but let's try to hit for that 90, 95% of the class could read something very simple. So maybe something that was written for, for children, for youth on the topic. So thinking of these four, it's just a very, very comprehensive approach to, to the text, multiple entry points, layered, more fulsome and connected exploration of content um, <clears throat> and building all that background knowledge. Here's an example. So this next one is a template. Um, and I've actually changed this template. I don't know if I changed it or I'm have a plan to change it. But the big idea, curricular competencies and content, I've actually um, since deleted that and I just put learning standards because standards is content and competencies together. And the big ideas, they're, they're just too big and, and vast. But these, building these as a department in a couple of our um, secondary schools, in a few departments in three of our schools, they have been playing with building quad text sets, collections that they can co-create and share. And in a couple of the schools, they have a big turnover, um, just the numbers go up and down. So it's not for any particular reason, they're great places to work, but they um, end up, somebody comes in to humanities for a year or they go in just for a semester. And then that teacher is looking for, where do I start? I want to do something meaningful with my time with these learners. What are the resources? So this is a great way to share in that way, um, but also to co-create as a team, essentially a bank that's a balanced, like having all the different types of text. So this topic, instead of just doing one of each four, which one could do, this is, uh, the topic is IndigiQueer, Indig which is an LGBTQ plus um, piece with the indigenous communities. And there is a big movement, uh, one of the, more well-known writing writers would be Joshua Whitehead, who's a poet and, and performer. And so there's the uh, collection of target texts, visual texts, complementary texts, and accessible texts. And then down below, just some ideas of follow-up assignments. So this was co-created myself and uh, the, oh, look, we have a typo in there. Ha, <laughs> two typos in there. Huh. with the uh, coordinator of Indigenous student success, uh, Hannah Morales, she's brilliant. She and I put this together for, for a team and there are other collections coming together. So in the resources I've included, uh, something out of the University of Delaware that is all about this and has great examples in the context of social justice. So on to vocabulary, vocabulary knowledge is knowledge. The knowledge of a word not only implies a definition, but also implies how that word fits into the world. It's really, really hard. So a lot of the students who are not reading above a grade six level, it comes down to a lack of vocabulary and background knowledge. So with, again, there's intersection of many things, students being able to just self-select their comfort zone of, oh, I'm interested in ponies, so I'm going to study ponies and do this in the context of ponies. And then all of a sudden they've done 12 years of ponies. They can tell you everything about ponies, but they don't know a lot what's going on in their community or other things that would give them access to the world and be able to engage differently. So that vocabulary and background knowledge is what holds students back from that more sophisticated reading. Now with vocabulary instruction, there are direct and indirect methods, but the instruction and what the National Reading Panel uh, came out of their research, what is that layering of a variety of indirect and direct methods. 
So yes, bring it to life, drench them, use that vocabulary, exaggerate it. We see Anita Archer doing this all the time in her videos. She models this beautifully, how to drench the students in language, but also having them use it. So when we do dialogue in, in my classroom, uh, we do a lot of, of dialogue because we can unpack that thinking and what's your, would support that with you're thinking with an example from the text, all that you can give immediate descriptive feedback. <coughs> um, sorry, see, folks focusing on the cough, so I can't think. Uh. Um, I have the students have essentially a vocabulary cheat sheet. So the key vocabulary they're working, whether it's up on the wall, a word wall, or in social justice, we had their social justice cheat sheet. The expectation was that the, was that the, the specific words, those important words were being used. And there was an accountability of the students to use the, the correct vocabulary and to use that sophisticated vocabulary, the target vocabulary. And students were encouraged to correct each other if you could restate something using that, that vocabulary to do that. So we modeled that through a lot of dialogue. Um, direct and indirect is, of course, I just saw um, completely reversed there. I do apologize where it should say direct on the right. That's really funny, actually, because this has been published somewhere. <laughs> Making a note. Um, on the right are the pieces that were identified for direct instruction by the National Reading Pro Panel and what is in the Teaching Reading Sourcebook by CORE, Consortium of Reading Excellence. So these pieces of word consciousness and word play, direct explicit instruction of specific words, analyzing word structures and word parts. So that's the morphology and using context to de determine word meaning. Those are the pieces that were identified as the big areas of focus. So I'm gonna just look at two pieces with that. Morphology, my goodness. Smallest parts of words that hold meaning. So prefixes, suffixes, and bases. 60% of all of our language comes from Greek and Latin roots. And those of us over a certain age may have received that instruction, but I'm at the cusp, I'm at the beginning of, of whole language. I did not receive um, much of this. I was in the tail end, so maybe a little bit in, in elementary school. And then I didn't encounter it again until I studied a science course in, in um, university. So a lot of my learning of that came out as an adult and the world just opened up to me with vocabulary and able a multi-syllabic strategy of breaking words into those chunks with meaning. It just opened up the world to me and made language more logical once I was, my intention was brought to that. 90% of all vocabulary from STEM um, come from Greek and Latin roots. So there's a huge value in teaching this. And that could start very, 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 very early. So it's essential in those secondary classrooms, but really when you look into the research for the fourth grade slump and why that happens, why do students who seem they could read in grade three, all of a sudden um, they are not progressing in grade four and that gap widens and widens and widens. This is one of the pieces that uh, is a cause for that. So if we think of grade, I think it's the grade two curriculum triangles, we'll try. So the structures of the words within math, science, and social studies coming from the Greek and Latin roots starts very, very, very young, but it is essential for their success. So if we look at something like a big honking word, right? So this is a big word <coughs> that's fun to play with. I do it with students too, even little ones. Um, but just to show as an adult example and looking at this big honking word, otorhinolaryngologist, Hmm. So we might know ologist. Okay. Someone who studies. And then you look in there for a part rhino. Oh, rhinoceros. Oh, big nose. That's what's special about that rhino. Probably something to do with the nose. Hmm. Larynx, larynx. Oh, wait a minute. Laryngitis. Something, maybe something to do with the throat. Okay. So I have someone who studies nose, throat, maybe Otto's ear. That's a constructivist process. So going through and a student playing with it, trying to figure it out themselves you have a lived experience. It sounds airy fairy. It's not. The student goes through, plays with the word, and then that's when you go to the dictionary. Now we go double check, right? And we can explicitly teach the pieces, of, of course, but that dictionary usage as it shows up in 
um, in the vocabulary instruction research is for the students to try to construct their own understanding first, even if they're wrong. Again, this is that Velcro. It's a background knowledge. It is an experience, that Velcro. Even if they're wrong, when they look it up and are given what's correct, they have this experience to work with. And say, like, oh, okay. It's also fun. So otorhinolaryngologist, that is an ear, nose, and throat doctor. So that, the teaching morphology, biggest bang for your buck. Uh, vocabulary becomes more connected and interdisciplinary, logical. English becomes less arbitrary. So we notice and apply meetings within words independently. Like the students just become attuned to it. So if you think of equity and equality, equivalent fractions, equi, equi, equi. Well, we're going to learn that equi is either something to do with a horse or means equal. So logic can, can come into it and the, and the world just becomes... Um, easier taking away the big fear of big words and students are made aware of connections between words and consistent spellings within word families so playing with those word families so for example if you were thinking of equa and we look at this family tree if you think of what means equal consider unequal and then with the students saying okay so well we've, we've determined that equa is something to do with equalities well, if unequal, we know what that means. So un would mean, students say not. Okay, let's test that. Let's write up a bunch of N word, un words, you know, uh, unmanageable, unrealistic, un, 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 un. We've tested that. Does that hold true? It does. So building uh, morphology walls. And uh, I, I look forward to being able to share a few people who are working on that with this fall, doing some uh, morphology walls in uh, grade eight to 12. So different things, morpho morphograph walls, uh, word families and matrices. So that's where it says take and those boxes were and showing how with the same base, that word take how you can add on one or two prefixes and change the meaning and the suffixes and just really, really word play. Again, doing any one strategy repeatedly is soul sucking for everyone. You won't enjoy it. They won't enjoy it. Ba yon, yon. However, them having different strategies and using those strategies that fit the word, beautiful. Which words do you choose? The ones you're using, especially in science and socials that fit that classroom that you're teaching. Like I told you about the social justice cheat sheet. We broke those words down, explicitly taught those words, made connections, logical thinking, meaning connections to other words, word families. So <laughs> a couple of these photos are just from the internet. Like that tree is not mine. Um, and playing with word families. And of course, this scientific, in the mathematics piece there, using as part of learning journals, having the explicit vocabulary instruction embedded in all areas. So using words from units of study, students constructing meaning, then consult that dictionary. Drenching in usage, and morphology matters is a, a guide online. It's free online. Again, I'll link, it's linked there, but at the end, there's a huge list of resources. Fantastic, sort of the starter pack. And it's a great free online, uh, great way to get started. Other than that, uh, Joan Sedita, Keys to Literacy, has, has some great starting points as well. So in bringing together another strategy, Again, I wouldn't do this for every word and all the time, but taking time with semantic mapping. So mapping of meaning. This brings all of those other four elements together. Um, this template is the cheat sheet template for the teacher that just has ideas of how, what can go in each section. So bouncing over synonyms and antonyms. That is a little bit different from on the left, the non-examples and non-examples. So synonyms are actual, the words the same or almost the same meaning that you would find in a thesaurus. So there's that thesaurus usage. How do we use this? How do we know? Explicitly teaching that. Explicitly teaching antonyms. Because teaching related words and the opposites are help to cement, cement meaning. So if you think of trying to learn 
what something is that's unfamiliar, knowing what it isn't sometimes is where the clarity comes from. So that is related to examples and non-examples, but that's not as literal or as tight as a connection as a synonym or as opposite as an antonym. So examples and non-examples. And that could be that word in action. So maybe a quote from a text, drawings, symbols, sentences, descriptions, a joke. If you can tell a joke with a word, word you've mastered, if it's a good joke, um, you've mastered the meaning. Related words. So this would be the words with the same root. So word families. It could also be words that connect to the same topic. So if it is a word that's really obscure that if you're looking at the morphology, really, would you use the other words in the family? Not so much. Then instead, you might use words that are connected to the same topic. Again, it's about building semantics. It's about building the understanding, building meaning. So spending some time on that. And that definition up at the top, using words, of course, that make we know that put it into your own words. But it's that try it first independently, spending a little bit more on time. This construct your understanding. Try that out. Work with a partner. What did they say? Hmm, there's a huge disconnect between what you said and what you said. Why would that be? Huh, time to look it up. So giving it purpose and being really explicit with each one of those pieces, this semantic ma mapping framework is something that I would do periodically and really teach the kids the pieces because any one of these is its own strategy that the students can then apply themselves. So if in secondary for you're teaching them to have, say, study cards, let's say it's a course, they're doing AP environmental science, there's a huge honking exam at the end of that. So having study cards can be a valuable thing. But we just say, oh, write notes on the cards. No, explicitly teach it through this framework. You're now cementing the content, the ideas, which is the background knowledge, which is the vocabulary, and really cementing that through a structure that's meaningful. So there we go. Now is the, the vocab, two big bangs. Comprehension. Okay, this is a funny one. Where are we with time? Ha! The construction of meaning of a written text through a reciprocal interchange of ideas between the reader and the messages in a particular text. So this connects to that idea with the prosody in, in fluency, where one reads it and that nuance and what's being created with that text using the structures, using the particular patterns of language, using the punctuation, you know, how a dash can change the intended tone, that reading, and that's that repeated reading, we go back and forth, and, and there's an interplay of my interpretation, my background knowledge, what's this person trying to say, and the empathy that an engagement, it becomes so complex and intertwined, <coughs> even though we can pull out each one of those pieces. So, the big strategies that make a difference, it really comes down to these five. And these five have been boiled down again out of National Reading Panel, the Foundations for Literacy document, and also Joan Sedita's Keys to Literacy because I really like how she boils them down a little bit more. So I've sort of reorganized them in, in more in her context. So the five biggies are comprehension monitoring, so keeping focus while reading, stopping and reflecting. So this main idea piece, stop, reflect, restate, infer. So a lot of those things, and this is, this is a funny thing. We talk about Scarborough's Rope, and I talk about Scarborough's Rope probably a little too much, but uh, Scarborough's Rope and all the different threads um, and how that fits within the discipline areas when people are having that little battle dance of, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, I'm sorry, of balanced literacy, aside from the three queuing system and, and not wanting to go there, but a lot of those things, people say, well, what's wrong with inference? What's wrong with making connections? Nothing. Those are incredibly important pieces, especially the visualization has come out in studies that that is a very important strategy to teach. But the balanced literacy, it's not that all of it is bunk, 
It's just a matter of being more explicit, more intentional, and doing all the things. Not just some of the things or the superficial dabbling, but really being intentional. So this in these comprehension strategies is really where we find those. The other piece is with that balanced literacy, a lot of it is living on that side of the road. It is in the language comprehension piece. You know, Adrian Gear has some great stuff, sure, in, in, in these pieces. And if that's what you're trying to achieve, then great, pull from those resources. But the bottom part, the decoding that we're not talking about today, and those students who are struggling and need that, that's not included explicitly to the extent that is required. It's not enough with the balanced literacy piece, right? So we know that, but this is where people can sort of find their work. Like um, I have a colleague at one of our biggest secondary schools who did her master's on reading strategies. And she's tweaking it slightly right now, realizing that some of them aren't big bangs for the buck. It's not gonna be a big payoff. But that, oh, visualization is more important than what maybe she had perceived before. So it's just a matter of tweaking. It's not wasted time. We have spent so much time in the last, you know, depending how long you've been teaching, 5, 10, 15, 24 years, doing some rich pro D. When none of us are wasting our time here. But those pieces can be very valuable in this section. So honor that work you've done. Maybe you're saying, oh, I already do that. Of course you already do that. Maybe you want to do it a little bit more or with more intention. So in the comprehension monitoring piece, the restating, the inferring, this um, two-column note-taking is a really great strategy. So uh, Cornell notes, there are different frameworks you could use. So whichever one speaks to you, great. But it's that piece of note taking where part of it is very objective. So it's that summarizing main ideas. What do you just see that object taking yourself out of it? But the other column where it's your responses, that's where the connections happen. Text to world, text to self, text to text, whatever. That fits right in there. So it's not so much about just a smattering of, oh, all these great things we could do. They boil under these five headings and then you know that you're hitting it. So two column note taking really balances that main idea pulling out and the personal response, including your questions. So sometimes there's, what is it that, is it smart reading? I can't remember where there's the question symbol and the exclamation mark and the two, the links for a connection, all that sort of stuff. If that's what floats your boat, Fantastic, but it's just that balance of objective, main idea, what is the author stating and how am I interacting with this or what connections am I making? Um, <coughs> visualizing, uh, visualizing strategies falls under there too, but it's that two column note taking, big, big, big bang, big bang. It also reinforces again that, that main idea, which is completely relevant in biology class, in literature class, in mathematics class, in foods class, it's everywhere. So two column note taking, there's your personal experience and the objective uh, pulling out of main ideas. Graphic organizers, number two. So top down topic web or hierarchical structures. So if we just said to you, okay, tomorrow at staff meeting, I'd like for you to speak to that thing you've been working on. You'll probably boom, think introduction, um, a body, points, maybe I've got three things I want to hit and a conclusion. That structure is just in you at this point. And it's a very valuable structure. It also helps you determine big main points and sub points. So again, main idea and supporting ideas. So that hierarchical structure becomes a thinking habit and a, and a, and a structure for thinking. So whether we are writing or how we are receiving. So that receptive language and expressive language, it all of these cross over into, so receptive reading and expressive writing. Each one of these has both aspects to it. So the graphic organizers, any hierarchical structure, bang on. So it can look like a web with bubbly things. Also, if doing webs, please, 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 some students' heads are already a web. My head is a web. I live in a web. So when I put things on paper, I need it to be linear. So my processing is visual. 
when it comes down to, okay, it's go time, it's time to apply. I need it to be in line. So being inclusive and remembering that <clears throat> different minds um, can work in different ways. What's important is that it's a hierarchical structure. Whether it has bubbles or cutesy things, please don't turn it into a, a, a art project. The point is the structure. The student can then personalize and make those choices of which framework is going to work best for them. And for some, it will be very visual and decorated with little drawings, but drawings can be helpful. But a stick man is fine. We don't need to have, you know, gentle esky here. Vens are also important because, again, out in the world, we see vens. Compare and contrast is a, another thinking structure and commonly used. Uh, Joan Sedita, Keys to Literacy, said graphic organizers. The great thing about graphic organizers is that there are so many of them. The worst thing about graphic organizers is that there are so many of them. And it's so true. Like, what's with that fishbone? I can't deal with the fishbone. It gives me a headache. It gives me stress. I like art. Don't give me an art project. And it makes no sense to me. So keeping it really simple, really purposeful, and allowing for voice and choice and personalization. One size will never fit all. Summarizing, hard to teach, worth the effort. Oh my gosh. Even in my master's classes, so many people had a hard time with summarizing. I'm including a little resource. It's not out of extensive research. It is out of other people's extensive research where I've sort of compiled the criteria and what is and is not summarizing, again, um, opposites, uh, what is and what is not. So really defining it, getting clear, it's quite concise with a bunch of instructional strategies of how one could teach summarizing. Um, question generation and answering. So National Re Reading Panel puts this into two separate categories. I just put it together because it's- Karina, sorry, I just oh. want you to be mindful of time. Um, 10 minutes, right? Yeah, but there are questions. So oh, okay. Thank you. I'll make it three. <laughs> I've been hitting the button. Thank you. <clears throat> so the question generating and answering, this I'm going to come back to just in the next and the before strategies, predicting, engaging. So that's the prior knowledge. Question generating and an answering. I, okay, there's a summarizing thing. As I said, I have a gift for you. But this, please, 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 big bang for your duck, buck. Big, big, big bang for your buck. So big, you're going to get a duck? Yes. Teach Bloom's taxonomy. The revised Bloom's taxonomy, revised on his own criticism of his work, Bloom's criticisms. Um, what I do is hand out the words. We do a constructivist process. Do you try to put the words in order of complexity? And then I will hand out verbs and have them, sorry, try to put them in order of complexity. And then we discuss what the actual order is and correct it, make it accurate, put the words up. Then I put out verbs that are related to each one of the categories. And then students categorize them. We discuss, fix, why did you choose this instead of that? Fix it put it together, and then we do question stems, and that stays up all year. And I got to tell you, half the headaches that you have around, are they critically thinking? What is the level of their thinking? When it comes to now crossing over into assessment, um, trying to explain to a parent why their student has is, is only emerging, and they're doing low-level thinking, they haven't been able to analyze or apply. It is a beautiful, 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 beautiful thing. So teaching blooms, um, and again, I want to keep super, oh, there's all these different resources, sorry. See, look at all that. I'm going to give you all these links and resources, yeehaw. And this is that QR code for the people who would like to have the certificate. And I am Karina Fitznar, if you're interested in getting a hold of me. I'm friendly-ish. And should we move to questions? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one's going back to your reader's theater question or mm -hmm. discussion. Yep. And they're wondering how you manage the weekly performances, i.e. a class of 24 kids. Who's going to uh, present? How much time do they take? And how do we ensure fair assessment is there? if it is to be assessed? 
<clears throat> All right. So I think it's about getting really, really, really clear on what you're assessing. So if what we're looking for, and if I've created, so I use blue taxonomy on a daily, we refer to it. So that self-reflection and peer reflection has been explicitly taught. So in, if that is within embedded in your classroom approach, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to manage things like reader's theater because the students are equipped to give very concrete and specific feedback, whether it's using rubrics or your checklist, whatever it is you've provided and you've explicitly taught and practiced and using scaffolding of I do, we do, we do, you do. And even modeling in that explicit instruction, I actually have some role playing as how, what does that feedback look like? The student's expectations for feedback then becomes very high, the students' expectations of what people are giving them. Again, that everything gets tied into assessment because I don't give grades for everything. This is process work, learning work, right? It's going to show up when you do another independent practice later. So that means you want good quality feedback, it becomes valued. That means then that we can go through a process and I don't have to see them all. If it's more of an embedded process and an ongoing process, I don't need to see them all. There is that accountability. I'll go where I, I know where the hot spots are and I want to make sure that I've seen everyone. And perhaps also I've done things where there's a cycle of say on Fridays, it's usually Wednesdays because I don't want to miss it. So like there might be at the end of the class on the Wednesday where a certain group goes and it's sort of to close our day and I try to place it in secondary in a longer block somewhere where we've got a larger chunk of time. This can be sort of a fun opportunity for learning where we're watching, but I'm giving feedback. So it's productive in multi layers. It's not just a community event or just watch without purpose. We're there and learning through this experience. So maybe weekly having a group so there's sort of a schedule where this group will go and that group hasn't um, embedded in, but also that they can do this within their groups and reap the benefits of, of the experience. Because sometimes it's not a matter of the viewership that's most important. Does that answer? What's next? Yeah, one is more uh, looking at the amount of time needed to complete these activities so that you can do that assessment. But I, I think, you know, with the um, schedule that you have here, if as an educator or sorry, as a classroom teacher, you are walking through and monitoring as things go on and have kind of a rotation that if you're, you're working on this mm-hmm. for, you know, four weeks or something, and you have six groups of students working together, then try and have it so that you're able to visit each of them two or three times Mm -hmm. at different days process. And you're doing more of that explicit thing right in the onset. So you're giving it a chunk of time to get it going, but then it's monitoring. So you're not spending that same amount of time as, as it goes along. Now I do do things like this, even in a single block rotating block in secondary Of course, it's easier to give up more time in in an elementary structure or a potted structure. In one of our schools, all of our grade 10s are potted into humanities where they have English, social studies and careers potted blocked together. So they're with those same students all year for half the day. So it's easy to do that in in their structure. In other ones, it's trickier, but it can still be done. So it's a hard thing to answer in that especially in secondary, the structures are so different, but it's worth it with things like this to give it the time it requires. But those scripts can be done in the context of other content. So whether it's a literature content piece or social studies or whatnot, they don't have to stand as a separate piece. You can overlap and definitely do more with less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's one more question that I want to address before we move on to our panel discussion. Bef- uh, this is a question about before reading. Is there any evidence that previewing unknown words, skimming and trying to decode before 
reading help poor decoders with their comprehension. And I know, um, I think it was Kate and Aaron who spoke to this a little bit about that importance of going through previewing any vocabulary and some of the more complex words with the students is definitely going to help boost their comprehension. And you can even in the higher grades, when you're going into some of those more complex words, incorporate some of that morphology instruction, discussing what it means, building that vocabulary and background knowledge mm -hmm. as a whole class and not necessarily just singling out uh, a, a student that needs the support. Absolutely. And that research there's, yeah, not singling out, but you can bet that you may know about that one student that you you can pretty much know that they don't know all of these words, but you can pretty much bet that you have at least a handful of people in there who need that same same information. Maybe it's one of the words or different. Karen Hansel was so, in any competition she took part in. Sorry. She was known as the content. Um, a lot of that research comes under fluency. So you can find it under background knowledge and in uh, Natalie Wexler's piece. But when you look at um, fluency and the instructional practices for fluency, pre-teaching the vocabulary is a big part of that. So absolutely. Now, if you are assessing fluency, you want that to be a cold read. But then that cold read passage that you've used for assessment can then be used for explicit teaching and then unpacking that vocabulary one would need. Absolutely. Sometimes though, if you are trying to explicitly teach them to use context clues as a strategy for understanding vocabulary, then maybe you want them to have a cold read. But then that's about being clear of what is the intention of that lesson. So if it's teaching the context clues, a cold read and then modeling those strategies and building those strategies, great. If it's about accessing this text and having a rich read, then absolutely pre-teach that vocab and a lot of the research of that is found under fluency. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation.